to see what she has for us today. Good morning, everybody. Uh, just want to get this up on my screen, so give me one second. All right. Uh, good morning again. My name is Kate McDonald. I am one of three shareholders at the law firm known as McConaughey and Sarkissian. Uh, myself and one of my partners, we specialize in representing contractors, developers, and some specialty trades um, and all of assortment of different construction issues. Uh, my third partner, she does family law. I do not touch it. Um, I stick to my construction. <laughs> With that, we are all business owners. And as such, we have all assumed uh, some amount of risk. Uh, it could take a single incident, whether it's a slip and fall at your uh, office or uh, whether it's a product or a service that causes injury to one of your customers that could significantly impact your business. And honestly, it could potentially have a severe financial consequence on you and your family personally. As such, I wanted to take the opportunity to speak with you all just to make sure you guys are all thinking about this because it really hurts me when I see uh, people that are trying to start their small businesses come to me that weren't properly prepared and unfortunately, one lawsuit could put you out of business and like I said, have some very severe consequences financially. Um, with that, this is just intended to be a very high level uh, review or discussion. I have to do the typical attorney disclaimer and say, uh, if you need more specific information, I am going to direct you to an insurance professional or an attorney to have a more in-depth one-on-one conversation. With that, if at any point anybody has questions, please feel free to ask it when it comes up. Do not feel like you have to come to the end. I'm really here to try to help answer any questions. And if I can't, I will let you know either who to contact or just tell you I will get back in touch with you. So one of the ways, um, and please know I am not an insurance adjuster or broker, uh, so I have no affiliation with insurance companies. But one way to potentially manage uh, your risk as a business is a general or a commercial general liability policy. So examples of situations in which your business and potentially you personally could be responsible for paying various costs such as medical or legal expenses is if someone other than you or an employee comes to your place of business and is injured, if someone's property is damaged and you are found to be responsible, if you promote your company and accidentally use wording that is uh, copyrighted or trademarked, or lastly, if someone's reputation is damaged by something you or an employee said, these are all circumstances that could trigger coverage for you under a commercial or general liability policy. Now, some considerations uh, for you all to consider is, do you interact with customers? Do you have a premise that you are inviting people to, such as I know we had one woman that owned a farm that I believe she invited people to, or if you have an office, if somebody comes on site, trips and falls or slips, or potentially uh, maybe one of those goats gets out of control and bites somebody. This is all when coverage could be triggered. If you do a lot of advertising, again, this is becoming more and more prevalent where I have seen cease and desist letters going out to businesses because you don't realize that you've used a word or a phrase that's trademarked. If you're using large equipment or if you have products, just something to sit down and consider because I really want you to weigh your risks. And if you're out there, it's worth inquiring into what it would cost for such a policy. Now, who could be held responsible? And I wanna back up a little bit. I am hoping that everybody here is registered with the Colorado Secretary of State, your business. Now, I am not a tax attorney. I cannot get into the advantages and disadvantages of the different corporate structures. 
However, the one thing I did want to touch on is if you are reg registered as an individual doing business as, for example, Kate McDonald doing business as McDonald Construction, you have some risk there that is not associated had you been set up as a corporate structure. It's very difficult to separate you from your business because you are essentially registered as the business doing uh, business under a trade name. So that is why I just want you to really consider whether maybe it's better for you to step out and potentially register as a corporation or LLC to separate yourself individually from the entity. Now, if you registered or are registered or as an LLC or a corporation, uh, typically what you will see in these circumstances is the business will get sued. With that, it does not mean that you or an employee could not get sued as well. However, under Colorado law, in order for you to be held responsible for the tortious conduct of your entity, which as we know can only uh, perform or take actions through its representatives, you must have actively approved, directed, participated or cooperated in the tortious conduct. So an example of that, let's say you have a premises and you know that there is one area in which ice always builds up. I'm not sure if it's a busted downspout, water getting directed over a sidewalk or whatever, but you know this condition exists and you do nothing about it or say employee, ignore that. Potentially, you could be held responsible individually with your business because you knew and act actively participated in the condition that caused the injury. The only other way that potentially you could be found individually liable if you're set up as a corporate uh, corporation, whether again, that's an LLC or uh, incorporated, is if you pierce the corporate veil. That's a little bit more technical. That goes on the back end of any type of judgment. Essentially, all it means is that you are commingling your personal funds and business and you weren't keeping them separate. But I really, if anybody is registered as a DBA, an individual doing business as, I would take a hard look at that as you might be setting yourself up for more risk than you want to take on. Now, what does a commercial or a general liability policy typically cover? So let's say you get a complaint filed against you, whether it's a slip and fall, or I had one case where somebody was a restaurant and they served sprouts that had E. coli and got a bunch of people sick. The first thing that will happen is you should tender to your insurance company. The insurance company then hires an insurance retained attorney. That is the same thing as under your auto policy. You automatically get an attorney who's representing you, your company and potentially you individually. The great news about this is under the policy, you should not be paying any of the attorney's bills. Those should be going directly to the insurance company. In addition to paying the attorney's fees, they're, they're also going to be paying, meaning the insurance company, the litigation costs. Those go from everything to filing fees, since we file everything online in Colorado, to experts. Let's say you had a slip and fall and somebody is alleging a severe back injury. One of the things your attorney might want to do is hire an independent medical examiner, another doctor, to look or examine this person. An IME, what we call it, can cost up to 20 grand. That is just for the doctor to examine and provide a report whether or not they agree that the injuries being claimed are true or are caused to the incident. So as you can see, the fees and costs can add up quickly. Even if somebody files a lawsuit and ultimately drops it down the road, under Colorado law, you're not entitled unless you have a statute or a contract to recover those attorney's fees. That means 
it could cost you thousands of dollars just for them to drop the lawsuit down the road. This is why it's very important to analyze your risk. And in this case, insurance might be the best step for you because you know right there you're going to have an attorney assigned and the insurance company is going to be paying those bills to fight a lawsuit, whether it has merit or it's called frivolous. In addition, if the trigger or the if coverage is triggered, the insurance coverage will be paying for medical expenses. Again, all of the medical bills for somebody that's injured as a result of a slip and fall, a product, or some type of service. For the contractor, I think it was Jackie's company, if her company causes property damage or resulting damage as a result of its work, that's when it's going to trigger coverage under a commercial general liability policy. The one thing to keep in mind with this is let's see, say you get a $1 million commercial general liability policy. Under a typ typical policy, your defense fees and costs are not going to come from your policy limits. Meaning, let's say I spend $200,000 defending the claims against you. That's going to be separate, meaning if there's a million dollar demand from the plaintiff, you should have a million dollar in coverage to cover those damages. The reason I raise this is, especially for the de uh, design professional or professionals, they typically have what we call eroding policies. What that means is the defense fees come out of the policy limit. So if I spend $200,000 defending a design professional, such as an architect or an engineer, there's only $800,000 to pay any damages awarded. It's very important that you know the difference and keep that in mind. Again, that's something you should talk to your insurance broker or agent about to make sure you understand. Lastly, under the policy, uh, there should be or the coverage should cover any judgments entered against you or your individual, again, up to policy limits or any settlement. So it's just important you guys really understand what you get under a general liability policy, because it's actually interesting to me how many people don't realize that if a lawsuit is filed against them, that, for example, your auto insurance hires an attorney for, for you. Or if in this case, if your business is sued or you and you're covered under the CGL policy, commercial general liability policy, you're going to get a defense. And that is huge given that frankly, a five day, let's say personal injury case can cost you over $100,000 in attorney's fees and costs. So again, uh, a lawsuit can have some very significant impacts on not just your business, but we all know if your business can't afford it, that money's coming out of your pocket personally. So earlier I referenced professional liability. That's different than general liability. And the reason I raise professional liability is we do have at least uh, one architect on uh, the call or on the Zoom. It's very important that you're talking to your agent or broker to make sure you get the right policy. Now, both of these policies help alleviate the financial burden on incident causes. They generally protect against physical injury to property or damage. But it's important if you are a licensed professional that you get the right insurance because a general liability policy specifically excludes professional acts. So if you are a design professional, an architect, and you are sued for a uh, error in your design, if you have a general liability policy, you have no coverage and you will get a denial letter and you'll uh, frankly uh, kind of be upstream with no coverage. That's why I really speak with your insurance broker to make sure you're getting the right policy. Now, what is not included? I think this is a helpful discussion so you guys understand. 
Uh, you'll always see, you know, bouncers that might get out of control at clubs. If they go up and beat somebody up, typically that's not going to be covered under a commercial general liability policy because it's an intentional act. So you, this is going to cover accidents, negligence, stuff like that, but not intentional acts of you or an employee. In addition, uh, a general liability policy is not going to cover uh, automobile accidents, pollution, or frankly, workers' comp, right? If you have an employee that's on your facility and they trip and fall, that's going to be under a workers' comp policy, which is separate. Really, what a commercial general liability or liability policy is focused on is third-party claims, what that means is a third party outside of your entity is making a claim as opposed to a first party. That means, like I said, an injured or an employee gets injured on your site or you have property damage to your equipment. That is a first party claim and will not be covered under a CGL policy. In addition, something that's important to know that not a lot of people do is insurance coverage under a CGL policy does not cover contractual liabilities. So for my contractors out there or even design professionals, a lot of contracts that you enter into are going to have what we call an indemnification provision. That provision says, hey, contractor or subcontractor, you're going to indemnify me, the general contractor, uh, in the form of uh, you're going to defend, indemnify, and hold me harmless if I get sued for any claims arising out of your work. A uh, CGL policy will not cover that contractual indemnification. Rather, what it's going to cover is negligence. So it's important to know that just because you have a, a commercial general liability policy, it's not going to cover any contractual liabilities that you sign up for. Lastly, product recalls. It's not going to cover if you are manufacturing uh, you know, any products and they have to be recalled for anything. It's not going to cover that. Uh, the one thing I did want to discuss on top of this is, you know, for some of the smaller businesses, a million is probably more than sufficient. Although I will say if somebody gets seriously injured or there's property damage, a million can go very quickly nowadays. However, if you're a contractor or a design professional and you're building a $2 million house, a million might not cover you. And that's why, again, I'm going to direct you to uh, your insurance agent to discuss an umbrella or access coverage. I'm also going to do a plug. Um, again, I'm not associated with an insurance agent or broker, but everybody here should really consider personally having access or umbrella coverage individually. It is usually not that much money and it gives you a million over whatever you have. So I'm going to say it's something simple, especially if you have kids that are running around your property or driving, talk to your agent about that. I know nobody loves paying the premiums, but when an incident happens, you are going to be so glad you have the extra coverage. So one of the other things I wanted to talk to you all about is the different types of policies. This is very important that you understand what type of policy you have. The first example is a claims made policy. Let's walk through an example. The policy, as you can see from uh, the chart up above, is it's effective from January 1st through December 1st of 2016. It has what we call a retroactive date of October 1st, 2015. So a claim is reported during the policy period. However, the loss occurred before the policy period, but after the retroactive date. As such, the claim here is going to be covered. However, had the claim actually occurred before the retroactive date, it would not have been covered even if it was reported during the claim, during the effective period of the policy. 
Uh, I state this because there's a lot of people that end up getting claims made policy coverage and they don't understand how it works. And it's very important that you do. So if you have one of these policies, you make sure the next policy you get covers any gap you might have. Another thing to note is, let's say as of December 31st, 2016, you're going out of business. Uh, you're shutting down your doors. So you're like, I'm going to cancel my policy or I'm not going to renew. If you have a claims made policy, you want to talk to your broker about extending the reporting period. Because the one thing people are always surprised about is just because you were out of business doesn't mean you can't be sued for a product or work you did when you were still in business. Again, I apologize to keep going back to construction, but that's you know really what I do a lot of it. But let's say you built a house in 2016 and you're going out of business. Well, in Colorado under the statute of repose, a homeowner has up to eight years to sue you for defects or defective work with your house. That means just because you're out of business, it doesn't mean a claim won't be made up to eight years after you're out of business. And if you have a claims made policy without an extended reporting period, you are not going to have coverage. And that could cause some significant financial impact, even if you're no longer in business. Because if the entity has no assets, guess who's getting named individually? The owner of the company. That's opposed to what is more common. Typically, we have what's called an occurrence uh, policy. An example here is, let's say an electrician purchases a policy on an occurrence basis. Again, the effective period for the policy is January 1st, 2016 through December 31st, 2016. A claim is reported in February of 17 meaning after the policy expired, even though it was not reported because the loss occurred during the policy period, you are still covered under that policy. So let's say somebody slips and falls at your business and that occurs during this policy period. They typically have up to two years to file a lawsuit, which means you might be on two separate policies, or you know, you might have switched two onto you know insurance companies twice since then. It doesn't matter. You want to tender back to the insurance company you not just had the time before, but during the loss, because potentially you could trigger coverage under all three policies. With that, it's important to know that if you have a deductible or what we call self-insured retention. That could also mean you're paying three separate deductibles, um, but it's always better to put every carrier on notice from when the loss occurred until it was reported. So I really just wanted to hit kind of the highlights today. I know that was very high level. I'm gonna stop sharing that screen. So if you guys do have questions, I'm more than happy to address them. But like I said, oh, I guess there was one other thing I wanted to address. Um, for certain people, you might be doing what we call waivers of liability in Colorado. I will tell you for adults, these are, in, these are enforceable in Colorado. However, they're strongly disfavored by the courts. That means they're only going to be upheld for adults in certain circumstances, meaning there must be no common law duty to the public the service or activity cannot be essential, meaning it can't be like a gym or you're going to uh, ski or something like that. The contract must be entered into fairly and it, mu and it must not be ambiguous. Now, these waivers only protect against accidents, not you or your employees' uh, intentional conduct or your, uh, your actions. That means, for example, white water rafting. I know that's big in Colorado. If your raft flips just because that's what happens, that is an accident. But if one of the guides does something that causes significant injury, that waiver of liability might not be uh, enforceable. 
And even if you have an enforceable waiver, keep in mind that you could still be sued, meaning you're still going to have to pay an attorney to go and fight that lawsuit to show that you have a waiver of liability. And while it seems cut and dry, you should be able to send them the form and be out of it really quickly, that doesn't always happen, meaning you could be incurring significant legal fees when you should be protected. And if you don't have an attorney's fee shifting provision in that waiver, you're going to be paying those out of pocket and not recovering. So again, you know, I'm Sorry, I didn't dive into more specifics. I just really want you all to be thinking about your potential exposure as a business owner and steps you should be taking or could be taking to make sure that should everything go wrong, right? They're accidents. Nobody plans on having an accident. But should that go wrong, you, your business is not going out of business and potentially you and your family are not having to come up with thousands of dollars to pay the attorney's bills. Mm -hmm. So really, if anybody has any questions, uh, again, I'm more than happy to answer them to the best of my ability, or like I said, get you to somebody who can help you. So I go for it. I know. Okay. So let me just say real quick, I feel like we just got an hour of free legal consultation. So oh, thank you very much. Yeah. And, and I'm assuming that Jackie has some questions here. <laughs> I see that Pat does. Yeah. I have questions, but Kate, I'll email you separately. Okay. Yeah. Like I said, um, my email address is K McDonald. So K M C D O N A L D at M S law PC.com. I believe it's on the website as well. Um, I can, I, been happy to talk to you guys one-on-one uh, -on -one about stuff. You know, the one thing is I, I want to see you all succeed up here. Um, so please feel free to bend my ear. Uh, you know, if it's something that needs a little bit more research or work, we can have that conversation. But if it's just quick questions, I I'm really happy to talk to you all about it. Uh, so I have errors and omission insurance. Yes, um, that's professional. Professional, right. Yeah. And I'm always wondering, you know, do I have enough? But it covers more than the amount that a person has invested with our company. So that should be adequate, correct? It, it depends um, because I believe you said you were in the financial arena. Right. Um, I, depending how the policy is written, if it is written to cover up to a certain amount, um, it, it just depends on the level you're doing financial, what your business book is. Um, just make sure that if you're taking on more risk with a individual or an entity, whoever's investing with you, it might be worth a call to your broker or your agent just to say, hey, you know, I have this uh, client coming in. It's a little bit more than typical. I want to make sure we're properly covered. Right. The other right. thing you should be checking into is <laughs> most professional insurance um, policies or ENO, as it's also called, are eroding meeting defense fees and costs come out of your policy limits. That means, like I said, if you have a million in coverage and it, and it costs, you know, financial stuff, it might even cost more. Let's say it costs me 350,000 to defend and get the right experts set up. That's coming out of your policy limits, meaning I have less money now to try to settle your lawsuit. The other point I did not make, and I should have, is um, if you are an owner, uh, most policies, but look into it, will also protect uh, the employees uh, or current employees or directors or officers. So let's say you do get named individually in addition to the business. You typically will have coverage as well individually under the policy. And that's why, again, you want to talk to your broker to make sure that you would be covered if you get sued because of your actions with the company. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, of course. <laughs>